This is the 15th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. This is the first of two videos discussing the Carry Lookahead Adder. This video will focus on the basic operation of the Carry Lookahead Adder, and the next video will focus on the size and running time of this design. In the previous videos, we built a ripple carry adder and then determined that both the size and time of the circuits designed using this pattern grow linearly as the number of input bits increases. And then we finished by wondering if we can do better. Well, let's start with the size. Can we design an adder whose size grows slower than big O of n? Well, no. For the adder to grow slower than big O of n, we would need to be able to add input bits without adding gates or without making the existing gates bigger. Another way of looking at this is that each bit of input needs at least one unique two input gate. If there is an input that doesn't have at minimum its own unique two input gate, then it's not really contributing to the output. And we know from the way adders work that all the bits do affect the output. So big O of N is the best we can do. Fortunately, the problem of reducing the propagation delay is a little more interesting. To see how we can improve this speed, we begin by asking, where's the bottleneck? Or in other words, what's the key aspect of this design that makes the time linear? It's the chain of carries. Each full adder has to wait for all the full adders before it to complete before it can begin working. Ideally though, we'd like all the full adders to work completely in parallel. To do that, we'd also need to be able to generate the carry ins in parallel as well. Or, if not in parallel, we at least need to be able to generate those carry-ins in sublinear time. Right, so let's sketch this idea of having all these carry-ins in parallel like this. This diagram replaces the yellow chain of carries with these little green boxes. Each green box determines a carry-in directly from the inputs. Notice specifically that each green box has access to all eight input bits from both input A and input B. Also notice that this circuit does not have a carry in and that the rightmost subcircuit is a half adder, not a full adder. That's not typically what you would do when you build a carry look ahead adder, but building a carry look ahead adder is one option for our project one. And I wanted to make sure that there was at least part of this design for you to figure out on your own instead of just copying what you see here in the video. So if you do make a carry look ahead adder for project one, realize that you'll have to add that carry in input to your entire circuit and then you'll have to pass that carry in input to each of those green boxes and make a small change to the design of those boxes to incorporate that carry in. So now let's figure out how to implement that carry look ahead logic in those green boxes. We'll begin with the most significant carry in, which we'll call C7. We call it C7 because it's the carry in to column number seven. Now think about the different situations in which C7 will be true. One case is when both bits from the previous column are ones. In this case, there'll be a carry into column seven, regardless of what any of the other input bits are. So C7 is true whenever A6 and B6 are both true. Well, what else? What other situations would produce a carry out of column six and into column seven? Let's suppose only one of the input bits for column six is a one. In this case, whether there's a carry depends on the carry from the previous column, the carry into column six. So C7 is also true if either A6 or B6 is true and there's a carry into column six. At this point, we have a recursive formula for the carry into any given column. If we were to unwind this recursion and implement it directly, we'd end up with effectively the same big O of N pattern that's in the ripple carry adder. But if we develop a non-recursive version of this formula, we'll come out ahead. All right, to more easily understand this formula, both the recursive version here and the non-recursive version we're going to build, let's classify the columns into three groups. If both inputs in a column are ones, we say that that column generates a carry. We say it generates a carry because there will always be a carry out of this column. So in some sense, columns like this create or generate a new carry. If a column has a single one, 
we say that that column propagates the carry. It doesn't generate or create a new carry, but if there's a carry into the column, the column will pass it on or propagate it into the next column. Finally, if both inputs are zeros, we say that that column swallows the carry because there will never be a carry out even if there's a carry in. So in this context, what must happen in order for there to be a carry into column 7? Well, at a high level, two things must happen. First, some column to the right must generate a carry, and then all of the columns between must propagate that carry. So let's see some examples. So as we already saw, there's a carry into column 7 if column 6 generates a carry. There's also a carry into column 7 if column 5 generates the carry and column 6 propagates it. Similarly, we could have column 4 generate the carry and columns 5 and 6 propagate it. Or we could have column 3 generate the carry and then columns 4, 5, and 6 each propagate it. If we continue this pattern, we get this formula, which is certainly not easy to follow. So let's clean it up a bit. First, we'll define g sub n to be a n and b n. G in this case stands for generate. And we make this substitution because when both a n and b n are true, it means that column generates a carry. Defining g n this way allows us to clean up the formula a little bit because we can replace a5 b5 with g5 and we can replace a4 b4 with g4 and so on. Similarly, we'll define p sub n to be a sub n or b sub n. In this case, p stands for propagate. When either a n or b n is true, it means that column is propagating a carry. So we can further clean up this formula by replacing, for example, a6 b6 with p6 and replace a5 b5 with p5 and so on. When we make all of these substitutions, our formula is still long, but it's much more manageable. I think it's a little easier to see what's happening when we look at how the circuit is implemented. Now just a quick explanation, this notation here is called a named wire. The names show points in the circuit that are connected, but without showing the actual wires. Named wires are typically used when showing the wires would make the circuit harder to understand rather than easier. For example, this is what happened when I tried to replace the named wires with actual physical wires. I got about halfway through and ran out of room and the diagram just got cluttered. Those extra wires really don't provide any intuition about how the circuit works and they make it harder to follow. So let's go back to the version with the named wires and see how this circuit works. This set of AND gates determines which columns generate a carry. Right, this is just the AND gate for all the GNs. Similarly, this set of OR gates determines which columns propagate carries. These are just the OR gates for all the PNs. The key part of this algorithm is done by these AND gates here. These gates determine whether a generated carry is propagated all the way to the left. For example, let's focus on this specific AND gate. It returns true if column 2 generates a carry and then columns 3, 4, 5, and 6 all propagate it. And then the OR gate at the end tells us if any of the generated carries are propagated all the way to the end, thereby creating a carry into the particular column. Each of the green boxes in this diagram contains a subcircuit that follows the pattern we just looked at. This specific circuit is C7. The circuits for the other boxes follow the same pattern, but they get smaller as you move to the right because there are fewer columns that must be examined. To keep this video from getting too long, I'm going to stop here. Based on what we've covered thus far, you should be able to sketch the overall high-level design of a carry look-ahead adder and sketch the design of the carry-in logic, that is, what's inside all those little green boxes. In fact, you should not only be able to sketch out what's in those green boxes, but you should also be able to explain how that logic works. In the next video, we'll look closely at the propagation delay and size of the carry look-ahead adder.